Welcome everybody to the Sprint webinar series and welcome to the Battler Lounge. Um, I'm just going to introduce uh, Mr. Stuart Chap, who is the Director, Deputy Director General in charge of the programs at Sprint to provide us with an opening address. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. <clears throat> welcome to the Battler Lounge for the final Sprint webinar for 2021 hosted by the uh, Island of Ocean Ecosystems Program's Invasive Species Team. As I'm sure you're very well aware, the Pacific has continued to push for the goal of limiting global warming to one and a half degrees. Whilst we continue to encourage world leaders to act upon this goal, we also need to ensure that we prepare, prepare ourselves for the possibility that this goal may not be achieved and we are in the best possible position to adapt to the changes that are already happening and are likely to continue to some degree. The first line of defence to adapt to climate change, we believe, is our unique Pacific biodiversity. Resilient ecosystems are the most reliable nature-based solution for the Pacific to adapt to climate change in the local context. Climate change has already and is predicted to have more of a range of impacts on the Pacific Island ecosystems through disturbances from increased wind speed, rainfall intensity during cyclonic events, impacting on supporting, provisioning, regulating and cultural services they provide. Pacific Island communities are heavily reliant on resilient ecosystems to adapt to climate change as they provide for current and future development prospects. Invasive species, unfortunately, are one of the principal causes of biodiversity loss and the principal driver of species extinctions on islands and are a global threat to food security and livelihoods. Much of the Pacific is highly impacted already by the stresses of introduced invasive mammalian predators, such as rodents and invasive plants, which are transforming ecosystems increasing the vulnerability of species and decreasing the ecosystem's ability to adapt to change. Climate change threatens to compound these impacts through weakening ecosystem resilience, exacerbating the spread and establishment of alien species, intensifying their impacts and creating new opportunities for them to become invasive. Invasive species reduce the resilience of natural habitats, agricultural systems, and urban areas to climate change, while at the same time, climate change reduces the resilience of habitats to biological invasions. Pacific islands intimately connect land and sea. Rats, cats, and other invasive species quickly destroy these links, particularly by predating on native forest seeds, forest birds, seabirds and other vital ecosystem components. Species are the building blocks of biodiversity and ecosystems and their services. Invasive species have been the primary cause of global extinction, extinctions in the past five centuries. Island species are particularly vulnerable. Effective management of invasive species is key to protect terrestrial and marine ecosystems, supporting their function and increasing their community's resilience to change. Today's webinar, Rats, Reef and Resilience, will focus on these linkages and raise awareness of the contribution invasive species management can make as a tool for increasing adaptation to climate change. This webinar also marks the beginning of a significant regional invasive species mainstreaming strategy, which will be implemented over the next few years. The strategy and this webinar are funded by the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade under the Managing Invasive Species for Climate Change Adaptation in the Pacific Project. And I hope you enjoy the webinar this afternoon and actively participate in it. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. So, Stuart has alluded to what we're going to talk about today. Again, welcome, welcome to the Battler Lounge. Um, the Battler Lounge was first started about this time last year. It's something that we're uh, aiming to do more regularly. 
Um, but what we have done is we've come up with some regular uh, feature sessions, which we plan to, to use. And we're going to be introducing quite a few of those today, as well as following our theme of rats, reefs and resilience, and also talking about the, the upcoming mainstreaming strategy. And hopefully we can get some participation to assist in that process. So for now, I would like to share with you what Rats, Reef and Resilience is all about. We found that on the islands with no rats, there were about 750 times more seabirds. That equated to about 250 times more nutrients or nitrogen being deposited on the islands. And you could really tell the difference. If you set foot on an island with rats, it's quiet, it's eerie, you can hear the, the waves lapping on the shore. The amount of fish on the islands, or on the coral reefs next to the islands with seabirds, was 50% higher than the islands with rats. What was astounding was the growth rates of the ones that were at the Nemena site, the one with the seabird nutrients, grew up to four times more than the same species just transplanted to another site. Coral reefs should recover and, and fare better in the face of, of cyclones and in the face of, of coral bleaching if they are next to islands with abundant seabird populations. So I think in terms of both the health of the marine system and food security for communities that are reliant on coral reefs, having those intact ecosystems is really critical. So our coral reefs is like a buffer for our coastline. It acts as our um, first line of defense against the impacts of severe weather events or climate events. So that's why I think it's, it's quite important for invasive species to be integrated across climate change adaptation uh, actions in our countries. If you can maintain your healthy coral reefs and um, by enhancing their growth rates and, and their health through maintaining those seabird populations, you'd be giving them a, a greater sort of advantage of maintaining those food security resources. Rat eradication is low hanging fruit in terms of doing something on, on islands that, that will have a long-term benefit and not just to the terrestrial environment but also to the natural marine environment. Invasive species management is a really important tool for building climate resilience. Resilience building is really about building the ability of um, both people and their environment to adapt um, and build and come back after change. We have one of the largest um, nesting rookery, green sea turtle rookery in the entire region of Micronesia. So it's very connected to the culture. It's a big delicacy. Indigenous folks are afraid of the word conservation because it means no take, and no take means you know food security issue for us. The obvious lifeline, really, for these communities that rely on fish as their main source of protein for generations is really the reef. It's really to see the reef producing for the people in a way that's sustainable. The really important thing that people can do is try to take invasive species out of the invasive species silo and again make it a solution, not a problem. And that's not really about selling invasive species to people, it's about making sure that it really is a solution to the problems that um, communities are identifying. And um, I think if we start doing that, we'll transform that space. The thing that our people care about is, will it put food on the table tomorrow? Will it give me money to put my children in, in, in school? To me, it's very important that communication is seen as a tool to make invasive species sufficiently visible to the eyes of, of our coastal communities so that they see clearly the linkages between eradicating invasive species and how that would strengthen or contribute to strengthening our sources of livelihoods. The island conservation who are taking the lead on this eradication work who actually are, I feel, are very willing and actively 
seeking to work with us and, and understand what's important to these cultures because that determines the result. The management of invasives, uh, it needs to be considered seriously and it needs to be mainstreamed and integrated in nature-based solutions that um, countries and communities are considered as best solutions to adapt to uh, the impacts of climate change. We need to kind of reframe a lot of these things um, because I think a lot of the time we tend to see communities as lacking something, whether it's resources or knowledge or agency, but in, in fact they have agency, they have the ability to do things. Here's a willing community to do this work, understanding the work. And the bigger picture, I think, is for the neighboring islands uh, that share similar habitat, similar issues, and similar challenges with resources. Leadership is, is very important, and I think that's um, something that is missing in the invasive species space. It will require very strong leadership in order for invasive species to be seen as part of the whole solution to adapting to the impacts of climate change and building cli uh, community resilience. Wow, so there's some food for thought. We're going to be talking a little bit more about mainstreaming invasive species later in the session. Uh, right now, I'd like to introduce my first guest the Battle Lounge today, Mr. Joseph Pesey, who is the PRISMS Associate. Uh, PRISMS stands for Pacific Regional Invasive Species Management Support Service. Um, and the next uh, section of our session is a regular feature we're going to have called uh, Creature Feature. And while it's important to talk about invasive species a lot, um, it's also important to hone down on what some of those key invasive species are and learn a bit more about them so we can help manage them um, and help other people to understand why they're a problem. So, Joseph, what are we going to look at today? Right, thanks, Dave. Uh, so today's creature feature will be on an invasive species which most, most of us uh, really love to hate, and that is uh, introduced rats. So in the next session, uh, Richard Griffiths, which is one of our, who is one of our PRISMS partners from Island Conservation, uh, he will be uh, taking us through to the, uh, on the different types of rats that are found in the Pacific, what their characteristics are, uh, their distribution, and we will also dive in a bit on, the, um, on their impacts uh, in the Pacific. So enjoy the, the next video. In the Pacific, four rat species have been introduced. What we call the Polynesian rat, or in New Zealand, the Kiwari. The black rat, otherwise known as the ship rat. The Asian house rat, which is not depicted here, but to all but the geneticists, is the same as the ship rat. And the Norway rat. It can be a little hard to tell them apart if you don't know what you're looking at and if you do not have them up close, but a general rule of thumb to follow is that the Kiori are the smallest. Many people in the Pacific refer to them as mice. They have a tail about as long as their body. The ship rat and Asian house rat are practically identical. You cannot tell them apart. Both are in between Kiori and Norway rats in terms of body size and have a long tail, always longer than the body. The Norway rat is by far the largest, has a much shorter tail relative to body size and is not an agile climber like the others. It tends to be found near the coast or in wet areas. Another good way to tell if it's a ship rat or Asian house rat is if you can cover the eye when you fold the air forward. It's only useful though if you have a rat in the hand. Rats can swim, but not the distances necessary to reach the islands of the Pacific without our help. 
It was our ancestors that gave them the means to get here. The first to arrive was the Polynesian rat, Rathus exilans, which originated in Southeast Asia. Archaeological evidence suggests that 40,000 years ago, on the island of Flores, people were living with rats. It may have been here, on this very island, where Rattus exilans first developed its association with people. Its arrival in the Pacific followed the pathways of the first voyages, first to Melanesia, then to the western and northern Pacific, and eventually to Hawaii, Easter Island, and New Zealand. Ship rats and Norway rats arrived more recently with European voyages, but were also very efficiently moved around, as you can see from this slide. Rats are now everywhere in the Pacific. No country or archipelago managed to escape. The number of islands that rats did not get to can be counted with two hands. The islands that escaped are small, virtually inaccessible, and some not much larger than rock stacks. But you can tell which ones they are because they are simply brimming with life. They literally feel alive. Once rats arrived, their impacts were instantaneous and profound. And you can see here in this graphic how quickly it must have happened. Rats breed prolifically and can reach plague proportions in no time at all. Here are some images of a curie attacking and then eating a petrol chick on Henderson Island. And this video shows a rat preying on turtle hatchlings. These scenes are not unusual, but are playing out on every island, every night across the Pacific. Rats, along with other invasive species, are one of the reasons we have lost so much of our native biodiversity, and why many of our species are on the brink of extinction today. The effects of rats, of course, goes far beyond just predation of our wildlife. Their impacts are far-reaching, changing the structure of our forests and interrupting the ecosystem processes that sustain and nurture our islands and reefs. As you well know, they eat our food, damage our crops, spread disease and contaminate our water. However, if we look to the future, there is hope. Rats can be removed from islands. This slide shows the suite of islands where rats have been removed from to date, and the number is growing. With your support, we can turn back the tide on invasive species. Starting with the smaller islands, both uninhabited and inhabited, progressively moving to the larger and more complex islands. One day we could realize a Pacific free of rats and other invasive species. A Pacific where communities and ecosystems can thrive. Thank you, Richard. What a video. Uh, there's a lot of useful information in there. If you didn't know what a rat looked like or how to tell different rats apart, it's all in there for you. And what a lot of knowledge that Richard shared about the impact and the history of rats. Um, Richard is someone who has uh, managed rats for a very long time and you can tell he's very passionate. Um, and it's great to have someone like that helping us here in the Pacific. Our next session um, is basically my favorite time of the year each year. It's when we get to honor a Pacific battler um, for doing a great job um, helping their country in the Pacific, and uh, not an easy job to do. Um, I'd like to introduce Isabel Rash, who's here. Um, she is the JEF 6 Regional Project uh, Coordinator, if you haven't met her before. And she's going to let us know what it takes to be 
an invasive species battler. Thanks, Dave. Um, I guess we all share the um, sentiments when we talk about battlers and we think what comes to mind is the hard work and commitment that goes on on the ground to manage invasive species. And, you know, it's the type of work that really produces and results in outcomes that bring benefit to the Pacific community. So, you know, you say this all the time, it's really difficult to pick out, you know, who the winner will be every year because this, we, we're, we're blessed and to work with so many people who have this characteristic. But um, again, this year, it hasn't been any different to choose um, who the new Bettler will be for 2021. Um, and without further ado, I welcome everybody to join us in finding out who the 2021 Pacific Invasive Species Bettler of the Year is. Yeah, let's find out. Yeah, well done, Wallace and Fatuna. Exceptionally hard year to provide the award. As everyone knows, we've all been unable to travel. So uh, it's a real sign that Wallace and Fatuna has managed to do this only with remote help. So it's a really well done, really well reserved. First time we've had a team instead of um, a single person. So well done. Um, Next, our next session is out and about. And the reason we, like we have an out and about session is we want to go out and see what's happening around the Pacific every few months and catch up with the local battlers and see what they've been up to so everyone can learn from what they've been doing. Uh, to my left or right to you is uh, Dominic Sadler. He's the project coordinator for the Protect Project, which operates in the French territories in Pitkin Island. And he's going to let us know where we're going in the Pacific today. Thanks, Dave. Um, I'd like to join you in congratulating the team in Wilson Fortuna. Uh, bravo à l'équipe. Vous méritez uh, pleinement ce, cette, uh, ce prix uh, pour votre travail exceptionnel cette année. Um, so for the out and about uh, session, uh, we'll be following the Wilson Fortuna team um, on the work that they conducted um, on rat removals. Small island ecosystems are unique and are often refuges for biodiversity. They rely on a fine balance between the terrestrial, coastal and marine environments. This balance can be threatened by both natural and human factors. Introduced by humans, rats are a leading cause for biodiversity loss on small islands. Communities rely on the rich biodiversity found in coastal fisheries and reefs. These environments face a number of threats such as climate change and human activities. 
Invasive species found on land are an additional stressor as they can interrupt the nutrient cycle and increase erosion, leading to a decline in reef health. Coastal ecosystems such as reefs and mangroves offer protection against extreme weather events and play a key role in climate change adaptation. Healthy terrestrial ecosystems provide communities with essential services such as fresh water, food and storm protection. These services rely on biodiversity and natural balances. Some species such as birds and crabs live on land but create a bridge between the terrestrial and marine environments. These species feed in the marine environment and return to land to rest and reproduce. This brings a wealth of nutrients to the coastal areas which benefit both the terrestrial and marine environments. Rats are a threat to this linkage. They attack young chicks, eat turtle and bird eggs, crabs and seedlings. They are a leading cause of biodiversity loss, but they can be stopped. These islets are in Walsan for tuna. Rats were introduced by early settlers, and today the Environment Service is implementing an ambitious rat removal operation. The operation is funded by the European Union through the Protege project. The Environment Service aims to remove rats from all 14 islets in the lagoon. It has taken about a year to plan the operation and conduct community consultations. Island Conservation, the PRISM's technical lead for the Predator Free Pacific program, specialises in such operations and is supporting them. Though due to COVID restrictions, support is being provided remotely. The Environment Service team unloads their equipment ahead of a long day. They will be building a pig trap and setting up cameras. Wild pigs and feral cats are invasive species on the islets of Wallace. They damage the environment, compete with and feed on the native fauna and flora. The cats hunt birds and the pigs will eat anything they can find. They must be removed before any rat removal operation can start. If left on the islets, they might eat the bait destined to rats and compromise the success of the operation. The traps are built well ahead of the operation. Food is placed inside to attract the pigs. At first the traps are not activated so the pigs become used to them. The cameras allow the environment service team to recognise each individual pig so they can make sure they remove them all. To ensure the entire islets are comprehensively treated and all the rats targeted, a 25 by 25 meter grid is established. The Environment Service team uses compasses, machetes and flagging tape to cut and mark trails. Markers are placed every 25 meters so teams will know where to spread bait. This is hard and hot work in the tropical climate and will take about four weeks. So they can find the trail entrance, they place a different coloured marker close to the beach. Blue markers set every 25 metres will indicate a throwing point for bait and red markers will be placed along the way so nobody gets lost. They use a compass to make sure they are still going in the right direction and that their trails are straight. This work will take a few weeks to complete on the four islets and will be assisted by the entire environment service team.
few weeks later, the trails are cut, the teams are trained, and everyone is ready to get going on the first rat removals. Four islets totaling 21 hectares will be covered over the course of a week. The team is hoping for good weather, as rain would slow things down and potentially affect the bait and success of the operation. The Environment Service unloads the equipment they need, including buckets of bait. A final briefing of the different team roles and they are off. One by one, the blue flags set up in the previous weeks are visited and a set amount of bait is thrown in all directions around the point. Survey plots are set up so the teams can monitor how quickly the bait disappears. This will be useful when they return in a few weeks for a second round of baiting. Signs are put up to let the public know that bait has been laid and not to harvest crabs in the area and avoid dogs eating bait. The goal is to protect the environment for future generations, restore the connection between land and sea and create a healthier, more productive reef to benefit the people of Wallace. Wow, great work Wallace and Fortuna. That's how what it takes. It's hard work being an invasive species battler. It's not an easy job. Um, and they've done it all by themselves this year without outside assistance. I'd particularly like to mention uh, Sasefo Malau. Um, he joined us in 2015 for eradicating uh, rodents on small islands workshop in Tonga with a lot of other Pacific countries. And from that training, um, it's resulted in, in quite a few countries being able to do a lot of this work themselves. It's fantastic and great to see. And you can see why they are battlers of the year after that video. Next, we want to look at, um, at gear. As invasive species battlers, we all have our favourite bits of gear or tools or kit that we use. Um, usually after many, many years of trying different things, you come across um, something that's better than everything else and is a great help to us when we're doing our work. Um, so we're gonna to to make this a regular feature of the, of the session. Um, in the center here is uh, Mr. Bradley Meyer. He is the Jeff Six Regional Invasive Species Project Manager. And he's a man who has spent many decades in the bush with all sorts of types of equipment. What sort of equipment are we gonna look at today, Bradley? Well, thanks, Dave. Uh, as we've just seen, uh, invasive species management is really practical work. It often happens in remote places, and as a result, we lean heavily on the quality of our gear and equipment. Um, today, we've got a feature from PRISM's partner, um, Steve Cramwell from BirdLife International, who's going to talk to us about rat traps. Wow, cool. Go, Steve. Kia ora. I'm Steve Cranwell. Uh, I'm with BirdLife International um, in uh, Suva, in our Fiji Regional Office. And uh, uh, we are one of the uh, PRISM's technical partners for uh, Predator Free Pacific. And today I just want to talk a little bit about uh, how I go about surveying an island for rats. Um, just a little bit in terms of uh, different kinds of traps. So there's essentially two types of traps uh, for catching rats either can be grouped as, as kill traps or live capture. For the kill traps, there are a, a myriad of different designs from sort of molded plastic ones to self-resetting ones, 
and also the um, the snap trap, if you like. In terms of, yeah, as I say, the uh, the, the trap that uh, I'm typically used for, for surveying, it's the humble uh, snap trap or, or rat trap. So just in terms of um, relocating traps, um, the, as I say, the, the sets I mark with a different colour. Um, so I've used pink here and I number each trap individually. Um, so we've got one here. See it's marked there, the piece of pink ribbon. Uh, it doesn't have to be a long piece of ribbon. It's just enough uh, to essentially give you a, an indication of, of where the, the traps are. You need to make sure that they, they are securely tied um, both uh, to the trap um, just attaching the string to the, um, the staple that holds the uh, trigger lever and then yeah to a, a stem or something sturdy that essentially is going to hold the trap. So as I, as I was saying in terms of um, being able to uh, easily relocate traps uh, you want to you want to um, mark the, the trap line and um, yeah for instance I'll just use a piece of um, flagging tape and um, yeah, attach it to something at about eyesight and then it just enables you to yeah, obviously move between uh, from one point to another so that you can easily find where the trap sets are. So uh, just on holding and setting a trap, um, yeah, basically it's all about <laughs> making sure you don't get your fingers. The thing to do is, is um, I hold it uh, in my my left hand, I'm right-handed, and I use my right hand to um, manipulate the, uh, the, uh, uh, the trigger arm and the um, and the, the kill bar, sorry, and the and the trigger. Just pull the the arm back, put the trigger over the top of the um, top of the arm, lift the the treadle so that its trigger arm is is um, under the yeah, under the trigger mechanism. And then um, set it so that it's um, relatively fine, so that the, the trigger arm is the trigger arm is just on the edge of the um, the plate. So you just gently um, push it down till about that position. So if it's if the, if the plate is sitting at about that sort of angle, then you're about right. If it's something like that, that's no good, you know, because it's got a long way to travel before it'll go off. If it does go off while you're holding it, uh, as, as I say, um, so I use my, I lift, my left hand, um, put my thumb over the top of the, um, uh, the bar so that, um, yeah, if, if anything does happen, it's set there, it's triggered, but yeah, fingers are safe. Um, just in terms of baiting it, so I just put a, a piece of coconut under the um, under the triangle in the centre there, um, and just pop it under by lifting it up a little and putting it in like that. So that's that's really firm, you know. Um, they have to pull on that or you know um, put pressure on it to essentially remove the bait. You can put bait uh, in this well. Um, it's not it's not a um, a preference of mine just because the bait is very easily removed so it's just you know you have a reasonable sized chunk um, push it in onto those two pins and um, yeah um, but it, it doesn't take much for it see it's I've barely touched it and it's come out so as I say um, you, you can if you're using peanut butter put peanut butter in there and that works well but of course then you've got the issue that the, the peanut butter gets stuck in the well and you can wash it out so but yeah, you know, so I do have a strong preference for using coconut. Yeah, so I think those are the um, the, the main thoughts for now. Uh, you know, there's plenty to it, and as they say, like you know, for everything, uh, practice is, uh, makes makes uh, a big difference. So yeah, happy reading. Thanks, Steve. Well, there you go. If you want to catch a rat, that's good advice from someone who's probably killed millions of rats. Um, it's as simple as that. Go out and get yourself a vector trap and protect your uh, biodiversity and food. Um, next, we're going to carry on with our uh, REITs uh, 
that's reef and resilience theme um, back to the mainstreaming strategy. So in a minute, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Steve Menzies from Flinch Marketing, and he has been contracted uh, with us to help mainstream invasive species management um, into climate change adaptation and sustainable development. He's going to be working with us um, over the next 10 or 20 minutes to let you know what's happening and how you can participate in that. But what we'd like you to do is to make sure you have your mobile phone with you um, so that you can contribute and um, answer the questions that Steve has, and that'll help him in his work as he, as he continues on. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Steve. Welcome, Steve. Happy Friday, everybody. So um, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to run through a few slides, but as um, Dave mentioned, if you've got your phone ready, Isabel is gonna help me co-hosting this session. We're gonna collect some information from you. Um, but first of all, I'd like to thank the 30 odd plus people who've already contributed to the development of the, um, the mainstreaming strategy. And uh, hopefully my slides will appear soon so I can uh, talk through them. Yeah, so um, as I said uh, before, um, I've been working on the regional mainstreaming strategy um, for the last couple of months with the input of the wider stakeholder team. Um, and uh, today's session is really about uh, contributing um, towards that process. So right in the middle of the development of the regional component of the strategy, and I can talk to you a little bit about the whole process in the next slide. Yeah, so as you can see um, from the headline at the top there, Today's session is really part of developing and finalizing the regional strategy um, in January for ne of next year. And so the regional strategy will provide some settings and context for the development of the national mainstreaming strategies in four or five countries from the middle of next year. Yeah, so I come from an organization called Flinch Marketing, and we specialize in behavior change programs. We've been working in the behavior change space for about 20 years. Um, and a big part of that work is around mobilizing resources and looking at upstream change to enable uh, people to do the things that we want to do at the community level. But a big part of this whole process is really listening to our audience, you know, be that the communities, leaders, or even the funders. So we have insights that can inform our strategy. And um, a big part of what we're um, hoping to do with the regional strategy is to really engage those target audiences in the development of the communications activities and products. So this is just one example of a campaign we've been working on over the last couple of years to save the national bird of Samoa, the Manumea. And a big part of that process has been directly engaging national leaders and community leaders and the funding community to understand what needs to be done uh, to address some of the key issues around hunting of pigeon in Samoa. During the scoping process, uh, I was lucky enough um, to, to be able to talk to a whole range of people um, who, who are deeply passionate and involved with the invasive um, management process. And, and essentially what we're trying to do with the mainstreaming work is take that passion that's been localized in some particular areas. So by the way, congratulations to Wallace and Fortuna for the amazing work that you're doing. But how do we take that work and scale it up? How do we integrate it into the work um, that's being done to address climate resilience or improve livelihoods in a more effective way? How do we help people to understand the benefits that they can derive from getting behind invasive species management? And I think during the scoping work, Monica Gruber really sub summed it up nicely by saying mainstreaming means getting people on board so that they support the management of invasive species for their own benefit, which I thought was a really great way of looking at um, what mainstreaming means in, in practice. Yeah, so we, we were um, fortunate enough to sort of kick the process off really um, with the production of that little video at the start of the session and looking at you know, that amazing um, story about which I was not familiar with at all. Um, I guess it's relatively new evidence around the connection between rat eradication, a seabird protection, and the, and the resilience of coral reefs. But what an amazing story to start with in terms of engaging that wider community in the conversation of the importance of protecting you know, those, those incredibly valuable resources. But it's not just about rats. We're also looking at ways to um, reframe the conversation around invasive plants, invasive ants. Um, in a way that people can connect more directly with um, the impacts that it's having on their um, food systems um, and their wider economic livelihoods. So obviously for us, we have to set some objectives for the mainstreaming work. And at a top level, it's really about making sure that invasive species management is seen 
as a priority for climate adaptation across the region. So in, in many ways, that's about understanding, as uh, Philomena Nelson was saying in the video, how can invasive species management be integrated into climate adaptation planning work at the national level? In order to do that, we need to increase the understanding of how invasive species management is helping to increase climate resilience and support livelihoods. So that's our job really is to create some compelling stories together with communities and leaders so we can help to increase demand more widely so people get behind the invasive species um, project at a regional, national and community level. And ultimately that's about increasing funding for action on the ground. All right, thanks Steve and hi again everyone. Um, in order for us to um, contribute to the key objectives that Steve has just alluded to and um, contribute to the process of developing the mainstream strategy, we're going to present to you a couple of questions, um, which we will, you, we will do through Mentimeter. Next slide, please. Um, so if you have your phone on, please open your browser. And in your browser, please type the URL that's on the screen www.menti.com and load. So if you missed that, please open your web browser and type in the URL www.menti.com. So if you've loaded that, it should be prompting you for a code. So please, the code is also on the top of the screen and on the third diagram, and it is 73 nine zero one nine eight nine and press submit so that's seven three nine zero one nine eight nine next slide please so on your screen it is asking you to send us a greeting in your language so please think of the first few slides as a warm-up to our uh, discussion that is to follow If you are sharing your device with other participants, you're welcome to submit another greeting. Fantastic. I've oh, got a great turnout. We'll give it a couple more seconds to get everyone's greetings in. Yakwe, Bula, Kiorana. Awesome, fantastic. Oh, it's still going. <laughs> oh, it looks like Talofa, Steve, is our popular one. One was competing with Kiora. Kyor <laughs> neck All and right. neck. Next. Yeah. Next slide, please. All right, which country are you joining us from, please? Tonga's first in, Fiji, New Zealand, American Samoa. We got some people tuning in from India. That's amazing. Welcome, Argentina, Palau. Awesome, we'll try and get this, a similar number to the um, submitted questions in the first one, which was about 40. So if you haven't sent that in, please, you still have five seconds. Right, I think everyone's done this before, Steve. Mm. Fantastic. Very good. Oh, a little bit personal here, but um, if you can provide us with your name, that would be awesome. First name is fine. Alias is fine. Um, whatever name you want to send us today. Talofa Kennedy. Semisi. No phone numbers. No phone numbers, please. Awesome, everyone's getting real into it. That's great. Um, so maybe 10 more seconds to get everyone in because we're now going to head into the first discussion question um, directly related to the mainstreaming strategy. All right, if you guys are not already on what's on the screen, please click go to slide. Otherwise, if you're already there, please provide us with 
what are some of the main reasons that Pacific communities want to support the management of invasive species um, in their communities? So we've got a wide range of answers, uh, but we please ask that you provide us your top three. Right, our leading one, Steve, looks like the protection of native species. Interesting. You are really, really keen to get your feedback on this one to see, you know, when we go out to the communities and ask the question directly, you know, whether it, it, it resonates with those communities also. So this feedback's extremely helpful. So we're on a neck to neck thing here. Improving livelihoods is coming up. It's like a horse race. Yeah. We've got more people participating. So public well, health is lagging. Yeah. You know, and it's interesting to see kind of where this comes from, when, whether you're um, providing this feedback as an individual in a Pacific community or, you know, a service provider or a conservationist. That would be really interesting to find out in the later discussion, Steve, which um, you will be ending up with the open ended um, questions. So um, please, if you have more feedback or you want to contribute more, please uh, be reminded there will be that opportunity at the end of this session. So we've now reached 37, that's a good number. We'll go on to our next question, which um, we want to find out what are the reasons that uh, are stopping or that become barriers to Pacific communities supporting invasive species management activities. So we've got the issue of invasive species not being seen as a priority. Um, and then we've also got the inability to, um, or just not understanding how we can support. So, you know, we want to support, but we don't know how. So that's quite a wide range. And then in the middle, we've got um, people don't understand how we can support climate resilience or that there's too much of a focus on Western biodiversity values. So, and then we've got concerns about the methods used. So that might be a little too gnarly for some people, but you know, it's at the end of the day, it's work that has to be done. It's really interesting to see here that the second highest one is just the inability for people to know exactly how to get involved or support mm. invasive species management. So it could be as simple as, you know, practical guidance. So it's a yeah. useful feedback here. Um, mm. But obviously this idea of it not being seen as a priority next to some other issues that people might be facing on a daily basis, you know, begs the question of how we can connect it to those things that people find more important. Yeah. Fantastic work. If everyone submitted all their questions, we will move on to our next slide, which really we want to find out from you what you think are the best success measures for improving the management of invasive species in the region uh, by 2030. So is it that we need more funding to be allocated to this work? Is it that the communities need to demand more of this work to happen? Um, or is there a need for a greater understanding on how we can improve our livelihoods and our resilience to climate change? Or maybe we have all of that, but we need our leaders to call for a greater investment from you know, the donor communities and um, areas like that. So again, really interesting to see the, the um, emphasis on that greater understanding with the links on climate resilience. You know, we were sort of discussing before that most people would have been thinking that just increased funding would have been a best indicator, but, um, but seeing that, that clear link with climate resilience is a really interesting finding here. So we've got in the lead greater understanding of how it improves livelihoods and climate resilience, which is, Steve, how is that related to the mainstreaming activity or how can we use that to achieve this goal that everyone's chosen? Yeah, good question, Bella. I think you know, what we were trying to do with the, the video really at the start of the session was to ask people what was important to them. And I think you know some of the feedback from J.R. Rumal and Olithiato it was on the money in terms of understanding how can it improve the management of those resources that are so important to the local community. So I think um, you know, John's asked if he can share that video now with his wider community because he was unaware of those connections between rat eradication um, and the health of the reef. So 
you know, it's just great to see that the opportunity to, to start those stories being shared, you know, amongst the communities and then getting more communities to share their stories. So I think, you know, that sort of gets to the nub of what we need to do here with the mainstreaming strategy. Awesome. Well, Steve, this is the end of the Mentimeter session for this section only. Um, like we said before, there is an open-ended question, which will get everyone's feedback uh, at the end when, when Steve's wrapped up. So please do keep your phone handy still. Thank you. Yeah, so, so far we've um, identified a couple of key barriers through the scoping work. You know, the first of all, um, the issue that we face is that, um, you know, and, and I guess this comes through in the response to the first question about the, the incentive is that everyone working in this space is deeply, deeply passionate about it in the area that they're working in. Um, and the, the area that you're working in is massive. So you're dealing with a whole range of invasive species issues. But it's clear from chatting to people that um, in, in previous efforts we've been a little bit too focused on biodiversity. So even the response that was provided here about the need to protect native species might not necessarily be held by the wider community as it's a key driver for getting involved in invasive species work. Although we're deeply passionate about these things and understand the connections that may not be the case um, for communities, for leaders, or even funders may not be aware of these issues and the connections. So if we can improve the links between invasive species management and climate resilience and livelihoods, that's the, that's the core of, uh, of our objective as we've looked at before. It's a big barrier at the moment because people aren't making those connections. And how can we find those community champions or national champions and expand on the, on the small number that we've got at the moment to a much greater number of champions across the region. We need more community-based success stories with people like J.R. Rumal in that first video, uh, front and center, talking about why invasive species management is important to their communities. One other thing that came through in the scoping work is that at the moment we really lack a, a clear, clear, shared and motivating or inspirational goal that everyone can get behind between now and 2030, which is gonna lead us um, at the end of the session to our, our kind of final question. Next slide, please. Yeah, so essentially the regional strategy is focused on um, these actions at the moment. So this may change depending on your feedback, but how can we involve leaders and communities and funders directly in the development of the communications activities and products? As you saw with the first video today, getting people directly involved and having that conversation developing these compelling stories to show how invasive species management is, is really enhancing. How is it really supporting climate resilience and adaptation? How is it really supporting community livelihoods so people can get behind it? This work has been developed in close collaboration with obviously the, the climate change team within SPREP, um, partners like Island Conservation, who have you know, great reach and muscle in terms of um, you know, reaching out to a, a wider group of stakeholders and the Global Island Partnership. You saw Kate Brown, um, featuring in the video before she's, she's part of our advisory group. So a big part of what we're going to do with the regional plan is, is start to develop this bold vision so we can enhance, you know, uh, climate resilience and livelihoods across the region by improving the way we manage invasive species. Next, please. So at the moment, we've got a range of different products and activities underway. Um, we've started some media work. BBC World will be running a story um, later this year. Um, we're developing a webinar series in, in uh, collaboration with GLISPA and uh, ABC Australia. Um, as you've seen, we've already developed, a, we've started to develop a range of video products. We're working on a podcast series looking at a range of stories that connect climate resilience and invasive species management and livelihoods with the ABC. We're developing a prospectus style brochure so funders can understand the benefits of investing in this space. We're really developing a science media training program and engaging with media partners and uh, media colleagues around the region so they can get behind the program as well. And obviously making um, the most of upcoming opportunities like the Our Ocean Conference. So we can you know, make sure that the issue of invasive species and um, the protection of our valuable um, oceanic and um, nearshore resources um, is seen as a key issue that can be addressed. It's a low hanging fruit as Nick Graham said in the, in the video. So let's take these opportunities that are coming up in the next few months to really get that um, message front and center. So finally, today, so thanks for your patience and thanks for your feedback. This last question, um, and I'm, I'm sure Bella will be able to help me with this one as well. So this is a chance for you to provide us with some direct feedback on what you think success in invasive species management for the Pacific region really looks like by 2030. So it'd be good if you could take a bit of a moment to think about you know, a, a bold vision 
is it about um, seeing the Pacific as leaders globally in the management of invasive species for small island um, developing countries around the world or you know, wider than that? Um, I know we're very proud in New Zealand of the work that's been done around predator control. Um, why shouldn't the Pacific region be leading in this space with all the terrific work that's going on already? So have a think a bit now about the sorts of things that you think would be bold and inspiring um, as stretch goals for achieving um, the mainstreaming of goals around invasive species management for the Pacific. Is there anything else, fellow, that you'd like to add to this session? I think you've covered that really well. Thank you very much. Um, it's nice to see that we have responses already. Um, yeah, we've got the predator removal of islands in every Pacific island country and territory. That's definitely uh, something we would associate with success. And, you know, we're really hopeful that that can be achieved by 2030, um, if not earlier. Yeah, I like we've also got enhanced ecosystem services. Sorry, but I was just as I like that someone's popped in there, many success stories from all around the region. So I guess seeing, you know, how other people are defining what success means for them, you know, national and community level. So um, it's terrific to see these um, comments coming through. Yeah, we've got, we've got some common ones around national leaders taking the lead so that, you know, the rest of the communities follow. So that's something that's being shared from the audience. I love the one there about globally threatened birds are recovering. So that's what we're seeing in New Zealand now is some of these threatened species are bouncing back and I'm based here in Wellington. And it's a, it's a hugely motivating thing for communities to see the impact of the work that's being done around um, predator control. So it's a great one. Yeah, another different one, but very important is the um, awareness of the public. So this somebody here said members of the public are a lot more aware about their roles in managing invasive species because like in the previous uh, question we had, people do want to manage invasive species, they just don't know how. And we can achieve this by educating the public on what they need to know and equip them with the tools. Yeah, it's a great point. I certainly learned a lot today myself from Steve Cranwell and various other people. So thank you very much for all of that. We've got increased food security, you know, a lot of real practical um, and close outcomes for us as Pacific communities. So it's really nice to see that people are making these linkages at the end of this session. That's amazing. So great to see yeah, the extension there to biosecurity issues. So yeah, as I said before, you know, the, one of the keys with the mainstreaming work is to, to sort of and I guess that's reflected a bit in the rats reefs and um, resilience theme today is to sort of start with something that can connect you know, easily with the communities and then expand from that. So it's a bit of a keystone approach. This is great feedback. So thank you very much to everybody for taking the time to do this. This will definitely be very helpful as we sort of tidy up the, the regional strategy. It might be time to pass over to, to Dave now, but thanks, thanks again, everyone, for um, taking the time to do that. It's really helpful. Thank you, Steve. So as you can see, we're very busy over the next few years. Um, hopefully, we're all going to be uh, working with you all and we're all going to be trying to increase the amount of invasive species management is, that's happening on around the world. It's time for us to wrap up. Um, thank you for bearing with us. We did start 10 minutes late and now we're six minutes over time, but hopefully it was worth it. Um, I'd really like to thank the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade um, the project that we have with them, uh, Managing Invasive Species for Climate Change Adaptation in the Pacific, um, has allowed us to, to, to put these sessions on and provide this equipment and really has been instrumental in trying to get this message out in regards to invasive species management and climate change adaptation. Um, we've got a few more years of this project to go and hopefully we can uh, bring along more people and more organisations with us as we go. Um, here's our team here. Uh, you wouldn't have seen them all today because they've all been working behind the scenes. Um, the ones I haven't introduced already, we have uh, Jordan. He's our PRISM's communications guy. We have William in the middle. 
He's our researcher on resilient ecosystems, resilient communities. And we have Wayne, who's our key IT guy. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, big thanks to our partners, particularly Island Conservation, BirdLife, Steve Menzies, um, who, who put in a lot of time to uh, create the, the segments, a lot of the segments that we've been viewing today. Um, and also the team that has worked hard to put this together, such as Jane from Monarchy Fennel and Landcare Research, um, all the partners that have helped us out. Um, we're really looking forward to doing another Battle Lounge soon. It'll be much sooner than um, it has been for, since the last one. And we're hoping to do another one uh, in the first quarter of next year. Um, we'll have to wait and see what the theme for that will be, but we'll keep you posted for now. From me and my team, thank you very much. Merry Christmas. And we hope to see you all again soon. Merry Merry Christmas. Christmas.